All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I think we'll get started. It's a little after nine. Uh, so my name is Tom Sasani. I'm a grad student in Aaron Quinlan's group up in the Department of Human Genetics. Uh, and today we're going to do kind of a basic intro to data visualization using a library in R that many of you might be familiar with called ggplot2. So this is going to be a fairly basic intro to ggplot, but if you have no familiarity with it, hopefully it'll be uh, a nice intro to how to visualize data and get started visualizing data using R. Uh, so before, before we get started, just a couple of more kind of philosophical points about data viz and, and plotting in general. So the first is one that I think you've seen already a couple times from Aaron, which is the example of Anscombe's quartet. So this is a series of four different data distributions, and each of these data distributions actually has the exact same summary statistics. So the same mean, the same variance, the same correlation coefficient even. Uh, but the idea here is that even though the summary statistics are the same, if you were to actually plot these data, like is being shown on the left in this figure from a textbook by Healy, the distributions of these data are really dramatically different. They couldn't be any more different. And so this is kind of a, a nice manufactured example of why visualizing your data is so important and why calculating statistics as well as plotting your data is, is really, really crucial to understanding the underlying distributions. So jumping off of this, there's actually an example of uh, Anscombe's Quartet that I like quite a bit more, which is called the Datasaurus Dozen. So this is a data set that was developed by some folks at a company called Autodesk. And instead of being a quartet, it's now a dozen different distributions that look something like this. That again, they all have the same mean, standard deviation, and correlation coefficients, but they were actually designed to match the standard deviation and correlation coefficients of that scatter plot that looks like a T-Rex up in the top right. So it's this set of distributions, basically the same principle as Anscombe's Quartet, but I just think it's a way better uh, set of visualizations. Uh, and you can dig into the data set a little bit more and figure out actually how they made these distributions at that link that I provided uh, on the slide. The other thing that's a little bit subjective, I think, but also not, is that there is a such thing as bad data visualization. So this is, I think, I hope, is a purposefully bad uh, example of data visualization also taken from that Healy textbook, where ostensibly what we're looking at is uh, life expectancy data for various continents around the world from 2007. But this is really like an onion of bad data visualization. There are really layers to this one. Uh, we have a stacked bar plot that's 3D. It's got textures. It's got shadows. It's rotated like 30 degrees, so you can't even see where the bars line up with the axes. And it's in papyrus, some all caps, uh, some not. So this is pretty horrible, I think. Um, but the point here is not just that it's ugly. The point is also that it's communicating the data pretty poorly. You can't even tell where those bars line up with the, uh, the x-axis. So you can't even really get a read for what these data are supposed to be showing. So this is obviously another manufactured example. But the point here is that data visualization isn't just about making pretty plots. It's about communicating data clearly. So just a quick note, uh, some recommended reading about sort of data visualization practices that I like. Uh, the first comes from this textbook that I mentioned a couple times from Healy. This is just a nice intro to data wrangling and, and visualization, really all using uh, ggplot and the tidyverse in R. Uh, and a decent amount of this lecture is actually inspired by that. There's also a link here where you can, I think, see the first couple chapters of that textbook for free online with code examples as well. The other example that I like to cite is this book from Edward Tufte, uh, The Visual Display of Quantitative Information. This is kind of a classic in the data viz field. It's an oldie, uh, but it's a goodie. It's from 1983. And this is really a beautiful book with some really awesome examples of clear uh, and gorgeous data visualization. The one thing that I caution here is that Tufte is kind of known for having a lot of strong opinions and hot takes about what to do and what not to do in data viz. So if you read this book, it's beautiful, it's great. But there's going to be some stuff in there that might seem a little, a little salty. So I'd, I'd, I'd take what he's saying with a grain of salt at some points in the book. Uh, but in any case, plotting an R generally is a pretty straightforward exercise. We've already done a little bit of it in this class. Um, and this is sort of an artificial distinction that I've made. But some people tend to think of plotting an R as either being done in base R, that is using just what's available in the R that you downloaded with RStudio, not using any dependencies using functions like plot, lines, and points. And there's also this idea that you can use uh, what's called tidy data and programs like ggplot2 to make your plots and do your visualization. And these aren't completely distinct things. Obviously, you know, people use both of these methods a lot. 
Uh, I would say that tidy data and ggplot is kind of this unified theory of how you should be processing, manipulating, and visualizing data in R that we'll talk a little bit more about in this course. But really, the second point is what we're going to focus on uh, today, is, is using ggplot and tidy data. So the data set that we're going to use today for, for some of the examples is this MT cars data set. This is the motor trend cars data set. Uh, it's a data set that's included with R. It's pretty simple. It just contains some measurements of automotive performance for 32 different makes and models of cars. Most of these I did not recognize when I loaded the data set. Uh, this data set was collected back in 1973, so some of these are, are, are classics. Uh, but it's going to have stuff like horsepower, miles per gallon, weight, other metrics about these cars, and it actually makes a pretty nice data set to use for an intro to plotting. So if you want to load this data set in R, it's actually included uh, with the distribution of RU downloaded, so we can actually just go into our studio here, and if we want to load the MT cars data set, all we have to do is type data MT cars, and that's pretty much it. We can then visualize what's going on inside this data set. And so you can see probably on your own screen that this is what the data set looks like. Fairly straightforward, each row is going to be a make or model of car, and then each column is going to represent some measurement about that car, miles per gallon, weight, et cetera. If you want to uh, learn more about what each of these columns means, because I actually don't know what some of these columns represent, uh, you can click on that link and get a better description of what's going on in this data set. But this is a nice intro data set for what we're going to be doing today. Um, as you know, in R, making basic plots is pretty simple, using functions like hist or points or plot or lines. So for example, if we wanted to get a sense of the distribution of horsepower among all of the cars in this data set, we could really easily do that. I won't even type this one out. This is pretty straightforward. You could just do the hist command and then access the column of the MT cars data set you're interested in, in this case, horsepower, and you get a decent looking histogram. Nothing too complicated there. We can also do something like this, where maybe we want to visualize the relationship between horsepower and miles per gallon in the data set. That's also pretty simple using just base R. You can just do plot, give it the column uh, that you want on the x axis, the column you want on the y axis, and you'll get this you know, decent looking scatter plot that shows a sort of expected inverse relationship between the horsepower of the car and the fuel economy uh, of the car. But we're going to try and move a little bit past this today and start using ggplot to create, I think, some better data visualization uh, examples. And before jumping into that, uh, I'll just quickly describe how to install ggplot. This is fairly simple. Um, all you're going to have to do is go to your RStudio window. This should work without any issues if you just type install.packages and then pass in ggplot2, run that and then simply load ggplot2 using that library command. If you hit install, it should take a minute and it'll, it'll give you the readout of its progress down here. And that's it, ggplot is installed. Um, if anybody has any issues with that, yeah. Sorry? I'm pretty sure the standard distribution includes ggplot, yeah. I mean, you could test it by just running library ggplot, but I, I think the tidyverse should, should include that. So ggplot2, uh, again, is this nice data visualization library. The gg in ggplot actually stands for the grammar of graphics. Uh, and this is sort of a nice summary of how ggplot works. It's really a grammar. It's really a language of, of how to make plots. And it sort of comes with its own language. And really, the, the key thing about ggplot2 is that it allows you to create really nice figures, but it lets you do so by iteratively adding sort of visual elements to your plots. Uh, element by element, and we'll see how that works in a minute. Uh, but it makes for a pretty nice, easy, and clean way uh, to make plots using R. The one note here is that ggplot2 does prefer that we format our data in a kind of particular way. And the question that we just got about tidyverse kind of leads into this. The idea is that ggplot2 can work with just about any data frame you give it, but it works really well, and it's designed to work with a, with a kind of data that's called tidy data, or long form data. So some of you may be familiar with what this data look like, but just real quick, uh, to give an example of what tidy data actually look like, we can look at this table that's again taken from that Healy textbook. Here what we have is, uh, again, life expectancy data for various years for various countries around the world. And what you can see pretty clearly, and this is really the hallmark of tidy data, is that every single variable that you're trying to represent in your table gets its own individual column. So country is its own column, year is its own column, and the life expectancy data is its own column. 
This is actually kind of a redundant way to store your data. You can already see that this doesn't really lend itself to really quick by eye uh, comparisons. Um, and it actually sometimes even takes up more space and memory than alternative ways of storing data. But the point here is that by storing every variable as its own column, later on we're going to be able to really easily map those variables to visual elements in the plots that we're trying to create. Now, this is what tidy data looks like. Just for reference, this is what that same table would look like in untidy, or so-called wide form format. So here, every column is not a single variable. The country column is its own variable, but now that year variable is kind of spread across multiple columns. And actually, this is sort of a more efficient way to store the data. It's easier to kind of parse this by eye just looking at it, but it's going to make your job of plotting with ggplot actually a lot harder, and it's going to make manipulating those data quite a bit more difficult. Now, the empty cars data set is tidy. Uh, each row is its own observation, and you can see each column is a single variable. The first column is make and model, second column is miles per gallon, uh, et cetera. And actually, uh, Dr. Charlie Murtaugh, I believe, is going to go into much more detail about tidy data, how to manipulate it, what the tidyverse is uh, next week. I would definitely recommend going to that. Uh, the tidyverse is a super, super useful uh, kind of unified theory of data wrangling and data manipulation uh, in R. So I would definitely recommend checking that out as well. Uh, it's super, super helpful. OK, so let's actually make our first plot with ggplot. The way we're going to do this is pretty simple. Uh, if you've been copying the command so far, you should have the data uh, empty cars already loaded. I can make this a little bit bigger here. You've got ggplot installed. And to make this first plot, all we're going to do is type ggplot empty cars. And we'll explain a little bit what's going on here in a second. But if you just type this out basically verbatim and run it, you should get uh, sort of a decent looking plot down here in your plot window. So we'll come back. So this is the same command here. Um, and this is really ggplot in a nutshell. Uh, right now, what we can do is we'll walk through what's actually going on in each part of this command. Because understanding how you format that ggplot command is really going to let you create just about any plot you want using this package later on. OK, so what's actually going on with this command? When you call ggplot, the first thing you're going to give it is the name of the data frame you're trying to plot. So in this case, empty cars. That's pretty straightforward. The next command is this aes command. And what aes does is it actually maps the variables in your data to the aesthetic elements or the visual elements of your plot, which is why it's called AES. So here, basically, we're telling AES, we want the x points, or the x-axis, to represent miles per gallon in our data, and we want the y-axis to represent horsepower. So the AES command is not just for mapping x and y points. It's also going to be used to map all sorts of other visual elements to our plot later. Uh, but for now, this is really uh, the sort of the simplest version of how this works. And then finally, we just basically tell ggplot, now that we've mapped uh, our, our variables to visual elements, how do we want to represent those visual elements? And here all we're doing is saying we want to represent them as points. And so that's what g on point is doing. It's just going to make us uh, a pretty simple scatter plot. So it's, it's also possible you can get rid of this uh, g on point command entirely and simply just run ggplot empty cars. And the plot that you're going to get down here is basically going to have nothing in it. ggplot is going to know that you want the x values to represent horsepower. It's going to know you want the y values to represent miles per gallon. But you haven't yet told it with that g on point how you actually want to represent those variables in the plot. Um, but once you add that, that second command, you'll get the points and you'll get a nice looking plot. So we don't actually have to map our variables to those visual elements in that uh, first ggplot command. Uh, both of these other two commands will do exactly the same thing. They'll make exactly the same plot as before. So for example, you could read in the data set in this main ggplot command, and then pass in the aesthetic elements you want to plot directly to geom underscore point. And this is going to tell that geom point argument, we know we're using this empty cars data set. Every visual element is going to use the empty cars data set. But for the, the points, we'll specify that mapping explicitly. You could also do everything just within that g on point command. You could give it the data and the aesthetic mapping and call it a day. The ggplot is just necessary at the beginning 
just so, to know what plotting library you want to use. And this example obviously is pretty simple, but we'll see later on that each individual plot element that you stick onto a plot can accept its own data and its own visual aesthetic mapping. And that becomes really powerful if you're trying to plot the results of multiple data sets at once. But in any case, uh, oh yeah, so the other thing that's probably pretty obvious here is that that plus sign in between the first ggplot command and the geom point command is really crucial. This is really the bread and butter of ggplot that gives ggplot its flexibility. Is ggplot iteratively adds layers to your, to your uh, plot over time. So you've made that first object, you've added geom points to it. If we wanted to, we could do a plus, add a box plot to it, add a line to it. It would get really ugly, but we could do it. So the idea here is that plus sign is really critical. That's how we're going to iteratively add elements to our plots layer by layer. So for example, with ggplot, it's super easy to just add, say, a line of uh, best fit to our data automatically. So the way we can do that is we can come back to our RStudio window. And here I'm doing something a little bit different. So now I'm actually storing this ggplot command as its own object called p. And p is basically going to be our figure object from now on. And everything we add to this figure, we're going to add directly to p, our plot. So for example, we can come down here, and we can add to p our points. And now we can add what's called geom smooth. And geom smooth is going to plot a regression line to our data. So if we run this, and then add our, our points here, we get something that looks like this. And what you'll notice sort of off the bat is that this doesn't really look like a linear regression line. What R does is when it uh, fits regression lines to your data, it's actually uh, going to fit a, what's called a low S regression or a locally weighted regression by default, which is why it looks kind of smooth and funky. I think I actually switched the X and the Y points in my RStudio window as compared to what's up here, but same idea. Um, but what's really nice about this, right, is that we just added a regression line to our data with pre-calculated 95% confidence intervals without doing anything. R just did that automatically for us, um, which is another really powerful aspect of ggplot. Now, if we wanted to specify that we wanted like ordinary least squares linear regression, that's super easy to do. All we'd have to do is go back to our window and add a method that we want to use for regression. So we could do geom smooth and specify that the method we want is LM for linear model. And if we do that, we'll get our linear best fit ordinary least square style. Um, and that's pretty straightforward as well. But this is actually quite powerful. And using a language like Python, it would actually be a little bit more involved to say add a line of best fit with confidence intervals and everything to a plot directly like this. OK, so that's what that looks like. The other thing that we can do is within each of our visual elements that we've added to this plot, like the geom point and the geom smooth, we can start to customize colors, transparency, things like that. So we can come back to our command and to each of those visual elements, the points and the smooth line, we can start to specify what color we want, the transparency, uh, the fill of the line. So we can come back here and for example, we can say make the points blue. To make the points blue, you would simply say call equals blue. And then if we wanted to say make our line of best fit uh, maybe gray, and maybe we want our 95% confidence interval to be shaded red, and we want to take the transparency of the uh, confidence interval down a little bit, we could do something like that, where we specify the color, the fill, which is going to correspond to the fill of that uh, shading in the confidence interval, and then this alpha value, which is the same as transparency. So this is going to take the, the fill of that uh, confidence interval down to about 25% transparency. And this is just an example here. We get something that looks like that. That actually doesn't look that great. Uh, but the point is we can customize these plot elements kind of however we want and just do this for each visual element separately. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. And the answer is yes. So again, that's a nice thing about ggplot is because of this plus syntax, this iterative adding of layers, the layers are added in order, um, just like what was suggested. So if we change this, 
and took our geom point command and put it later, we could actually probably make this look even a little bit better. Where now the line is being drawn underneath the points and arguably it, it does look a little bit better. Yeah? So, so P already saved it as the plot. I mean, when you add layers to the P, but once you add the layer of P, you have to still have the layer of P. The concept that have the concept of saving the whole entire plot in the plot that we can do the Because if I type P again, the, the, the chart disappears inside the chart. So the layer is not added. Oh, so if you were to just uh, say down here, type P and run that. Yeah, so what you can do. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So instead, what we could do is we could take uh, basically that plus sign, put it up there, and then do that. So if you store P as that uh, object with everything added to it, then the, yeah, you can then basically save that single figure object. And then you can save P to, to a file, to a PNG or a PDF or something. Uh, that's a good question, though. Cool. So this is sort of the basics of, of plotting. Oh, yeah. So when you... Hmm. So are you you're not getting an error or anything? It's just a completely different looking plot? Uh, there's still an error, and then I add the last round. Uh, huh. Yeah, maybe Aaron can can take a look at that. So one thing that I'll point out is if you copy this directly into your R Studio window, I think the quotation marks are gonna actually mess it up because the quotation marks are in a different font. So you're gonna have to add in the quotation marks by hand after the fact, or just type it out uh, yourself uh, word by word, which is probably the better way to do it. Um, I think we'll keep on going for now, uh, since Aaron's taking a look at that. But really, this is, this is ggplot in a nutshell. Uh, another thing that we can do is we can take our plot and we can add things like x and y labels to the plot, as well as titles. This is super simple as well. There are a couple ways to do this. Uh, we could use the labs command, and we could simply type in x equals horsepower, y equals mpg, and you can even give your plot a title, um, which we'll just call mpg versus horsepower. And then you get actually nicely formatted axis labels, and you get a nicely formatted title. Um, but again, this is all because of that plus sign. We can just add these elements to the plot uh, layer by layer, which is pretty nice. Let me get that. Okay. So far, though, all we've been looking at is an XY relationship, nothing super complicated. Um, but what if we wanted to start looking at some more complex relationships in our data? This is where having tidy data and ggplot is really going to come in handy. So, for example, if we look at these data in the empty cars data set, we have a bunch of different variables that are represented in these columns. We have miles per gallon, we have horsepower, which we've already looked at, but we can also see that you know, the cars in this data set might have four, six, or eight cylinders. They might have three or four gears. We can stratify our data by a bunch of different variables. And so we can do this visually using ggplot pretty easily. So for example, what if we wanted to color every car's data point by the number of cylinders that it has in the empty cars data set? This is also super straightforward. All we're going to do is when we make our ggplot figure, we'll pass in the variables we want to map to the x, the variable we want to map to the y, and now we're going to map the cylinder variable to the col, the color property. And so this is going to make every data point in our data set mapped to the number of cylinders that it has. So if we come back to our, our studio window, I'll just make a new figure object here where we'll plot the empty cars. We'll say x equals horsepower, y equals mpg, and now color equals cylinder, and we'll add to that geom point. And then we'll be able to see what p looks like. Okay. So in your window, hopefully you're seeing something like this. Um, and this looks okay. Um, we're definitely coloring points by the number of cylinders that they have in the data set. 
But you might be able to see something that's kind of a little bit strange about this, which is that we're actually coloring these points apparently along a gradient, uh, because we have this color bar in, on the right-hand side that's listing how the points are shaded on this scale from 4 to 8. This is kind of not good for a couple of reasons. The first is that it's actually pretty hard to tell some of these points apart. So telling points that are four cylinder versus six cylinder, at least for me, is, is pretty difficult. And it's also defaulted to plotting these along a gradient, where ggplot is assuming that cylinder number is coming from some continuous distribution uh, ranging between four and eight. But we shouldn't have any vehicles that have five or seven cylinders. So why is ggplot thinking that we might? Why is it plotting these data along a gradient? So the reason for that is if you go into your RStudio window, you can actually uh, click on that drop-down menu. Uh, where is it? Over here. So up in this top right section, we've, I think, used this a couple times. You can click on the MT cars, and you can see what kind of data type each column is being stored as. So in empty cars, cylinder is actually being treated as a num, a numeric variable. So this is basically saying that ggplot saw the numbers 4, 6, and 8 in that column. And it thinks that that means that those are a continuous numeric distribution of values. But in reality, we know that cylinder number is going to be a discrete distribution. Cylinder numbers can be 4, 6, or 8. There's no in-between in this data set. So how can we plot our data not using color as this continuous distribution, but as a discrete uh, so-called factor or discrete variable. And the way we can do that is there's actually a couple ways. Um, this is one way you can, you can change that, is you can take your empty cars data set and you can explicitly treat the cylinder column not as a numeric distribution, but as a discrete factor. So a factor is another word that R likes to use for just a variable that's discrete, that can take on a set number of values that's not a continuous uh, distribution. So this is one way you can do it. You can convert the entire cylinder column into a factor using this command, which is fine, but maybe you want to actually keep your data frame as is and just kind of change things on the fly. So the other way we can do this is quite straightforward. We can come back to our ggplot command, and when we pass the cylinder uh, variable into the call property, we can just call factor and convert it to a factor on the fly. And if we do that, you get something that looks like this. So now, <clears throat> R is treating cylinder as a factor, as a discrete term. And so it knows that your data distribution uh, of cylinder number can only take on three values, either four, six, or eight. And so now it's colored them in a much more sort of unique way that arguably looks quite a bit better than coloring it along some uh, gradient. Um, you probably said it, but I mean, so if you say factor, but in, in the other example you say as dot factor, is factor just a GG plot command? Oh, yeah, yeah. So I believe so. I, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that to do it on the fly, you would just use that factor command, whereas if you were explicitly doing it in a data frame, you would use as dot factor. The as.type syntax uh, is, I think, something that's just native to R and not ggplot. OK. So this is pretty nice. I mean, yeah. Yeah. So there are a couple ways of doing that. Um, one would be to actually just assign uh, in your data frame, you could, I mean, potentially like write a function to assign certain cylinder numbers to certain colors. You can download different uh, color schemes from R that will assign the order of terms different, different colors. Um, could try doing that on the fly. I don't know that I'm actually super good at doing that on the fly. Uh, I'd probably have to do some Googling, but yeah. Um, I would probably do it by simply assigning, making a new column in the data frame that's called color and assigning the cylinder numbers to specific colors. Um, and you could even do what we did last time, where you'd maybe like create a vector 468, and then a vector with the specific colors you want, and create a mapping of those together. It's another possibility. Um, but that's a good question. That's, yeah, definitely something that I would probably stack overflow, just to be safe. Um, OK. So the other nice thing about that mapping that we can do in the beginning of the command with call equals cylinder 
is that what this means is that mapping that we've created, the color property to the cylinder variable, is going to be inherited by every visual element that we add later. So for example, let's add this geom smooth. Let's add a linear regression fit to our data. Now if we do that with this command that we've already written, where we're mapping uh, the factor uh, cylinder to the color property, you can see what we get is actually a plot in which every single group, every cylinder number, gets its own unique regression line that matches uh, the color of the data points in it. So this is another really powerful thing about ggplot, is that when you map a property to a variable in your data set in that first main ggplot command, every visual element you add after that is going to inherit that mapping. It doesn't have to. So as we showed before, one way to get around this would be to simply specify this aesthetic, say, specifically for geom point. So let's go back. Uh, we can create a slightly different looking plot. Maybe we just want one single regression line, but we want to keep all of the colors for the points as they are. We could take this AES command. We could copy it. And we could just move it. There we go. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah, no, that's, yeah, that's a good call. Um, ah. I'm smooth method LM. Oh, what did I do here? Method equals LM. Ah, that's right. So here, what we've done is we can actually get rid of that. This is x equals hp. So I'll, I'll explain this in a second. Um, at least I'm pretty sure we can get rid of that. Let's give it a try. Yeah. So in our main ggplot command, we've told ggplot the data we want to use, empty cars. We've told it that our x values are going to be horsepower, our y values are going to be miles per gallon. But now we're mapping that color property to cylinder number only for the points and not for the linear regression line. For the linear regression line, we're actually not specifying any mappings. We're just telling it to interpret the original mappings provided in that main command. So what we've done here is we've colored all of our points by their uh, aesthetic mapping, but we haven't done that for the regression line. So we've got our one main regression line going through all of our data, but the uh, property of cylinder is only being applied to the data points themselves. Okay. Now, at this point, uh, what's probably maybe apparent is that this actually really isn't the best uh, data visualization for these data. Uh, I don't know how informative it is to have three different regression lines going through these three different sets of data. Um, one maybe better way to visualize uh, the data in empty cars is maybe let's look at the distribution of miles per gallon or horsepower, but group those data by the number of cylinders the cars have. Our expectation would be the more cylinders the cars have, the less fuel efficient they're going to be. And so we can do that by making a box plot with ggplot. This is also fairly straightforward. So here, we'll make our figure object. But now our mapping is going to change a little bit. So since we're making a box plot, we'll make our figure object. We'll define our data set. But now we're going to want to group our boxes in the box plot by cylinder number. So we can do that by again passing in factor cylinder into our x property. And we can take our y property and let's just map that to miles per gallon. And then to make a box plot, you can simply type geom underscore box plot. So I think you get the trend here that all, pretty much all of these commands start with geom. If we run that and then look at our plot, you can see that we've pretty easily just created a nice little box plot grouping by cylinder number and looking at the distribution of miles per gallon in the data set. Now, if you were not to specify that factor cylinder and just pass in cylinder, I think this would probably break. So just make sure you're typing in uh, factor before you do that. There you go. 
As we mentioned before, we can map variables to aesthetic elements outside of that main ggplot call. So maybe we want to color our box plots by cylinder number as well. I don't know if that's something you want to do, feel free. You can do that pretty easily by simply changing the aesthetic mapping for the geom box plot itself. You pass in color equals cylinder. Again, uh, you're probably going to want to put in factor cylinder there. And you can color your box plots pretty easily that way. That's pretty straightforward. But as has been shown by a lot of recent publications, starting to, the field is sort of moving away from box plots because box plots don't do a great job of visualizing the underlying data distribution that they're summarizing. So in, in uh, ggplot, we can add layers to our plot in order to visualize both that box plot, which has medians, interquartile ranges, as well as the actual data points themselves. So we can do this by first going back to our command here, making our box plot as is, and simply adding to that box plot a command called geom jitter, which, as the name suggests, is going to create a jitter plot. And we can map the color of those points, again, to the number of cylinders the car has. So we can come back. And now we're actually visualizing the scatter of those points on top of every one of those box plots. Um, and there are definitely ways you can make this a little nicer. You can change how tightly those points are jittered to make it a little bit more visually appealing. Um, and again, you can change the colors. Here, the other issue to watch out for is that uh, the jitter is actually replotting some of those outlier points on top of the box plots. There are ways you can get around that. Um, uh, it takes a little, like a couple lines of hacking, but uh, it's pretty easy to look up on, on um, Google, really, if you want to figure out how to do that in more detail. But as Andrew pointed out earlier, if we were to change the order of these commands, plot our jitter first and our box plot after, the box plots would actually hide the jitter uh, underneath uh, each of the box plots. And so we can see that um, if we give that a try by plotting geom jitter first and box plot on top of that. So that is really not, not great. So really order matters here. And the order in which you add these plots iteratively uh, or add these layers to your plots iteratively definitely matters. So just watch out for that when you're making plots. You might be accidentally hiding some of the underlying data. So, yeah? Do you know how to choose it this way in the right bullet points? Or is there some random hacking? Some math that it's doing. Yeah, I don't know exactly what formula it uses for that. But you can, um, I can't remember the exact keyword argument. But you can change the spread. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's height, width. It might just be width, actually, will change the, the spread of those data. We can try that, um, if I remember right. The random seems kind of weird. I think it would be in a line, and then multiple different things. I don't know if that would be in the same. Oh, it's plotting those. So those are the, the plots, or the points that the box plot function has determined to be outliers. Oh, okay. Um, and yeah, so that's one issue here is that uh, the outliers in box plot uh, are being shown twice in both the raw distribution that we plotted with jitter and in the box plot. So there's a way to turn off uh, outlier plotting in the box plot function as well um, that will uh, get rid of that. Yeah, exactly. And this this one right here is a repeat. There's actually, I think, two dots down here, both at like 10 or 10.5. Um, out of curiosity, let's see if width does anything here. Yeah, cool. So I think that did. Um, so you can change the, the sort of scatter, how widely those uh, points are jittered with that uh, width command. Yeah. So once you have layers, Yeah, no, I don't, I don't, th I don't think, I don't think minus works. That's a, that's a good, yeah, it's a good guess. Um, other than simply just commenting out layers. Um, I don't think so. Um, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's sort of add the layers you want. You can comment out the layers that you don't want. Um, if we wanted to, say, get rid of that one, we could simply just comment it out. And it's easy enough, but. I think that's probably one of the best practices to put each layer as a separate line so that you can easily sort of turn things on. 
Yeah. Yeah, so you'll see in, in, in our studio when you type plus and hit enter, it'll automatically sort of tab indent that next line. This is generally because this, this syntax is the sort of preferred, yeah, best practices for making these plots. There's our jitter plot. Um, we can also pretty easily make a violin plot instead. Just do geom violin. If you want to try that, go ahead. Um, same idea, and then you can mess with the, the width of the jitter points and make a pretty decent looking violin plot. Okay, so one of the last things that I want to quickly talk about uh, that's really powerful about ggplot is that you can do the things that we've been doing so far, making violin plots, Bach plots, jitter plots, scatter plots. But ggplot also has some functionality that lets you actually apply functions to your data on the fly and summarize your data uh, into a single plot quite easily. So for example, what if we wanted to make a bar plot representing the mean miles per gallon values for each cylinder number of car? So this is actually a little bit more complex um, but R makes it relatively easy to calculate the mean miles per gallon value for each group and summarize it in a plot in basically a single command. So there are certain ggplot commands like geom underscore bar that accept arguments like stat and this function that you want to apply to the data. So if we were to, to go to this, uh, to go to our studio window, and we were to do p ggplot, and we were to do empty cars, as x equals sil y equals mpg. And here we'll just color the bars by cylinder number as well. When you type geom bar, again, you can tell geom bar to summarize your data and to do it by taking the y values and summarize them using the function mean. And if we then visualize what that plot looks like, we now get a pretty decent looking bar plot where R has done all of the work for you. It's calculated the mean, uh, it's summarized it, and we've even colored each of the bars by the cylinder number that it came from. So this seems kind of deceptively simple, but this is a pretty nice piece of functionality that ggplot has. And you can get much more complicated with it um, but this is sort of a nice simple example that shows how easy this is to do. Of course, if you wanted to, you could also say calculate standard deviation and add error bars to this plot. All you'd have to do is you do that calculation yourself and then just put a plus and add the geom error bar directly to this plot. And you could add error bars to each of these, uh, each of these bars. But this is sort of a cool piece of functionality that ggplot has that I think is worth mentioning. Okay. So I don't really have too much else. Uh, the, the one thing that I wanted to mention is that there's a really awesome cheat sheet from the RStudio people uh, that's available at this link. It's just a big PDF with just about every kind of plot you'd want to make in ggplot with instructions on how to do it. Uh, assuming you have a certain kind of data frame in tidy format, all of these are quite easy to make uh, with just a couple of commands, really. Um, oh, that's right. So the one last sort of, la nah, I shouldn't say last, I have a couple slides left. But one of, the, one of the last things that I wanted to talk about is uh, one library that I think will basically immediately make all of your plots look better. Uh, it's called Cowplot, um, developed by a guy named Klaus Wilke uh, at UT Austin. This is a pretty easy package to use. All you have to do is go into RStudio, install it with install.packages, cowplot and then load the library. And once you load the library, what this function or what this package is going to do is it's going to slightly change the aesthetics of every plot you make. So normally in ggplot, you can see that the background is kind of this weird opaque gray with a grid on it. Um, you don't actually have like lines representing the x and y axes. But if you load cowplot and then we remake this plot, you get something that looks like this, which personally I think aesthetically looks a lot better. Uh, now you have axis lines, that weird uh, sort of opaque gray grid background is taken away, um, and everything looks a little bit cleaner. Obviously it's personal preference, you do whatever you want, but I personally tend to like loading cowplot as basically the first thing I do after I load ggplot. I think it makes the plots look a little bit better. Okay. 
Just some final notes on sort of aesthetics and figure design. One of the first most important things is to make sure that your, the plots you make are colorblind friendly. Uh, this is really easy these days. You can just download colorblind color schemes for R, for the various types of colorblindness. Um, especially if you're presenting figures at conferences on big screens and your audience might have hundreds of people in it, you want to make sure that everybody can tell your figures apart. Um, keep it simple. Another reason why I like cowplot, you know, more elements in your figure is not necessarily better. Um, and that's just sort of a universal rule for data visualization. Uh, just a couple of fun links. Uh, the first is a nice list of colorblind friendly color schemes in R that you can download. Uh, the second one actually has a link to some cool Game of Thrones themed color schemes. There's a color scheme for every house, uh, which actually look pretty decent. Um, and then this last link is sort of like the, the intro to ggplot today, where uh, this, this guy at this website basically takes a data set and sort of iteratively improves it over time and makes a pretty slick looking set of ggplots at the very end of the, at the end of the tutorial. So I'd encourage you to walk through that if you're interested. Um, the last thing is, it's not really homework, but there are, I think, cooler data sets than empty cars out there that you can install and you can sort of experiment with. The first is called Gapminder. You can install it pretty easily like that. This is also a tidy data set, and it contains data about things like life expectancy and GDP for uh, all the countries around the world. You can create some fairly complex but pretty cool looking plots using just the tools that we talked about today. There's also a data set called ggplot2 movies. It's a tidy data set that's got data set about tons of movies that have been pulled from IMDB. Um, this one is also pretty easy to install. Make a lot of cool visualizations using that um, as well. And I think, yep, that's everything I've got. Uh, if anybody has any more questions, I'm happy to stick around um, or take them now. Uh, otherwise, hopefully, that was informative and you guys can get started plotting. Oh, and so the slides I put in Slack, I think most of you saw, I also pushed them up to the GitHub README uh, so you can access them there.